Good morning, welcome to our Christmas devotions. We're right at the heart of the Christmas story now. And in a minute, I'm going to read from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 to 7. After looking at an early passage in Luke and Matthew uh, with the angelic visits and all the great promises, this reading is far more earthy. So let's uh, read that together. Uh, but first, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this Christmas time. We thank you for these familiar passages. But we pray, Lord, speak to us afresh. Help us to hear your voice and encourage us to walk before you today, uh, look into you in your name. Amen. Luke chapter 2 verses 1 to 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria and everyone went to their hometown to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. So this really contrasts with the readings we've heard before. We've had angels with the great promises of God and glorious names that tell us who Jesus is and what he'll come to do. He'll be great, the son of the most high. He'll reign on his father's throne, reign forever. He will be the son of God. But this reading doesn't have any of that. It just is very, very earthy and it brings it down to earth. Uh, you'll see that, won't you? Um, he's born... Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is born. He's the king, but he's now born under Caesar Augustus, into Caesar Augustus's kingdom. Uh, Augustus had a great empire, but Jesus was the, the most high. He was the greatest king, but he was born under Caesar's reign. He was born uh, not into glory, but into disgrace to an unmarried couple. You can imagine the heir of the throne being born would be a great event. I uh, wonder a great celebration, but Jesus was born into disgrace. Uh, you can imagine that every uh, effort would be made for the arrival of the heir, uh, so that his arrival into this world would be easy, as, as easy as possible and safe. But Jesus is born into uh, enormous inconveniences on a journey. Uh, Jesus is born into obscurity in the backwater of Bethlehem, not in some great city or great palace, but in Bethlehem. Were it not for the biblical prophecy about Bethlehem, it would have meant nothing. Um, but Jesus is born into obscurity. He's born into poverty. Uh, he's laid in a manger. There's this really earthy feel to it, isn't there? Um, there's none of the glory and excitement of what's happened uh, just earlier. None of those... Uh, wonderful angelic announcements uh, that we've got in other places. These were the events, and they're very ordinary, very obscure, uh, very lowly in many, many ways. But uh, um, behind it, uh, I want us to see what God is doing. I want us not to look at the outside, but to look at the heart of this as well. Uh, to look at uh, the, really the, the greater thing behind this very earthy obscure, not very impressive story in some ways. Um, I want us to see the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ who left the glories of heaven to come to save us. I want us to see how, secondly, how, how even right at the beginning, God's plan of salvation, his plan for his kingdom that he's promised is way beyond this world's ideas of what ki a kingdom is and what greatness is. No one could think of anybody greater than Caesar, but Jesus is born under Caesar's rule and he will bring his kingdom in. God has a plan that is bigger than what we see on earth. We see behind this very ordinary picture, a uh, very lowly picture, God's plan and God's purposes. We uh, see that Jesus has uh, been adopted by Joseph. He's been brought into the line of David and that's important because the Saviour will come through David's line. We see that Jesus is, is then taken to Bethlehem to be registered uh, with the family um, because the Saviour will come from Bethlehem of all places. 
Uh, and therefore we see that God's timing is absolutely perfect. We might think he was incredibly inconvenient in, in many ways, but actually we see God's timing is, is wonderfully perfect. So what we see on the outside in this very ordinary earthly story um, isn't really what's going on at the heart of it. Something more special is going on. The, the fourth way I want us to see the, the, the deeper reality of what is going on is that is, is in Jesus himself. If we let the situation that was taking place around Jesus define who Jesus was, he would be a nobody. But the reality is that he is the son of God. And it reminds me again not to let the situation that we find ourselves in in the world to define us. This world has an idea of what greatness is. And, and, and I mean, it's often not what we are. But we want to be great often in the world's eyes. And that will lead us in a certain direction. It will mean that we start living for this world. Uh, if we are trying to, to live by the definition of what greatness is in this world. And so we're not meant to let this world define us. Like the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to let God define who we really are, not this world. And if we can remember who we are before God, then it will shape the way we live now. If we remember that we're his loved children, that he has a plan and a purpose for us, and we are part of his plan and purposes. If we remember that our time is are in his hands, that his time is perfect in our lives, then we are liberated not to live for the way the world sees us, but to live for the way that heaven sees us, the way that God sees us. And when we can live in such a way, freed from this world and its pressures, and we can live the way God sees us, we're liberated to serve God the way that he would want us to serve us. We're not going to live to serve ourselves and, and the earthly idea of what greatness is. We'll live to serve God. We we don't live for ourselves, we can live for other people and give ourselves for the plans and the purposes that God has for us so that we love others more, not just ourselves. We can live for his kingdom and not our own. I hope you can see what I'm trying to get at. I have tried to do this devotion three or four times and try to make it really clear, but that reading of Luke just paints a very earthly picture, but something very special is happening behind it. And we need to see God's hand in all of these things. Uh, and see God's hand is more significant in this world than, than, than what this world has become and what this world has shaped us, how it shaped us to think and behave. And we need to see God in uh, these things. So hopefully that helps. Let's pray that it would. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, for this very ordinary and earthly picture. Oh Lord, we want to see your hand in it, it's to see the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ, to see your, your divine plan, your kingdom that is greater than any kingdom of this world, to see what you're doing, but also to see ourselves the way you see us and not let ourselves be defined by the way the world sees us. Because when we do, we get dragged off to live for this world, but we want to be liberated from this world, to live in a way that reflects the way that you see us. Help us to do that. Lord, we know that when we, we're not loving the world, when we're not seeking to, to live for this world, then we are free to live for the way you want us to live. Help us to do that in these days. And Lord, I pray, help us to understand this devotion and, and, and be impacted by it so that we live liberated lives for you today. In your name. Amen.